Welcome to Vintage Audio Review. A Marantz SR930 receiver, circa 1984, was recently given to me for repair. Though much different looking than the classic look of the Marantz receivers from the 1970s, this 35 pound unit has a nice look to it with a lot of features. The complaint was that the SR930 was dead, of course. The first thing I did was check the fuse and it tested good and was of the correct value. That's usually the first place to start. Should you ever find a fuse covered in foil, and I have had units with that being the case, I would run away from that repair. Pressing the power button on only caused a very, very dimly lit FM to glow in the display, otherwise it was dead. I removed the top cover and the inside was fairly clean. I did try exhaustively to find a schematic or service manual for this unit but did not have any luck nor did I find anything that was close to it. While measuring around the main board I noticed that the heatsink was getting very warm particularly the right half of the heatsink. I had checked for shorts on each of the four output transistors earlier but they were good. That's usually one of the first things I check when something comes in dead. It's also worthwhile to note that the transistors are actually socketed which would make them easy to replace should that be required. I had measured the supply rails and they were plus or minus 60 volts which seemed to be about right for this unit. There is an SDK5136 voltage amplifier IC Q701 These type of amplifiers are often the stereo output module for many stereos and frequently go bad. I unsoldered it from the circuit board and the heatsink stayed cool. Fortunately, the board had some of the power supply points labeled on it and I found that one of the plus 15 volt DC lines was only reading about 300 millivolts or so. I was able to trace the line back to the power supply board but in order to measure points on it the board would have to be removed which meant the on-off power switch had to be unscrewed from the chassis, which required removal of the whole front panel assembly and the knobs. I was unable to measure much of it without a schematic other than the 15 volt DC and 6 volt DC LM style voltage regulator ICs. I removed those and tested them out of circuit as well and they tested okay. It was obvious that someone had been in this unit before as the leads to some of the transistors and regulators had not been trimmed or even inserted in straight. I removed all of the power supply board transistors and tested them with my Sencor TF46 transistor checker. They all tested good. I then started doing some resistance measurements around the 15 volt DC leg of the circuit and ultimately found a shorted 10 microfarad 16 volt cap. I then went around the circuit testing other electrolytic capacitors using my Sencor LC53 for value and leakage and they were all okay. I then powered on the unit and while the display lit up more, none of the functions worked. In order to work on the power supply board, I needed to have it lifted on its side. I decided that I needed now to have the board mounted firmly to get some more measurements done where I had to apply some pressure to the test points. And so I remounted it back to the chassis. I turned it on again and the display came on and the functions worked correctly. yoo -hoo! Apparently, there is a ground for the power supply that is made through the chassis. Here is the power supply board with the shorted cap pointed out. The ground connection screw can be seen in the lower right near J825. Once the display and functions appear to operate normally, a $29 SDK3156 was ordered. Removing the SDK3156 was no walk in the park either. As there is no room to get a screwdriver in to remove the two screws that hold it to the heat sink. I was able to use just a number two Phillips bit and some pliers grabbing the bit 
to loosen the screws to a point where I could remove them with my fingers. Apparently there is some counterfeit going on with SDK chips so when the new one came I weighed it and it weighed the same as the old one. This SDK came with some heat sink grease which was a bonus. Once it was installed the unit was powered up and connected to some headphones and there was sound although there was some hum as well. Though they tested good I replaced C724 and C726 both 100 microfarad 50 volt caps. I also treated the volume and balance controls with the Oxit T5. When I turned the unit back on the hum was gone. I eventually treated all the EQ sliders with the Oxit Fader F5 as well as the Oxit D5. Here is a little video I showed of a before and after treatment of one of the EQ slider pots with the Oxit. So what we're looking at here is the preamp output with a 250 hertz signal applied to the auxiliary input of this receiver and right now I have the equalizer band at 250 Hertz set to 0 dB and this thing hasn't been moved a lot in in a long time I'm sure and you can see it's just kinda moving up and down um, and I'm gonna go ahead and put it at max uh, gain So there it is at max gain. And it takes the analyzer a few seconds to settle down, but you can see it doesn't look very pretty. Left and right channels are just kind of both moving around. And let's go ahead and move the slider for that uh, equalizer down to the full attenuation. And we still see it moving around. So what I'm going to do now is apply some deoxidant to that uh, slider potentiometer and we'll see what happens. So right now we're looking at the same 250 hertz signal with the equalizer control at its center detented position. After the treatment of the deoxidant fader lube as well as the deoxidant D5. Um, it's much more stable and the THD seems pretty good. However, if we, if we bring the gain up to maximum boost, we can see that it's a lot more stable than it was, but the THD is pretty bad. Um, if we go down to about half that level of boost, it's not too bad at all. Now, if we totally attenuate the 250 hertz signal, it's uh, fairly stable again, and um, it's looking much, much better after the treatment. All the equalizer controls were cleaned and lubed, and um, it's looking pretty good. I could not find any literature, as I mentioned earlier, that provided specs for this vintage receiver other than it was either 105 watts or 130 watts into 8 ohms. I removed the pre-out main end jumpers and connected the QA402 audio analyzers input to the pre-out jacks and the QA402's output to the CD input. The SR930's EQ defeat switch was engaged to bypass the 10 band equalizer. Here is the THD SNR at 1 kilohertz for a 2 volt RMS input and output. The right channel has a higher noise floor than the left channel, resulting in about 10 dB worse THD plus noise than the left channel. The actual SNR in THD is not bad for both channels. Why the difference between the two channels? What I found though was applying the low filter caused the right channel to be much closer than the left channel. If I gently nudge the push button switch, I can make them match up, so I suspect the switch has some resistance on the right channel side. Unfortunately, the switch is sealed and I could not get cleaner inside it. Here is a plot of the THD with the low filter engaged. Much better. 
Here is the low frequency response with the low filter not engaged, showing a 1.2 dB flatness across the band with both channels very well matched. After adjustment of the balance control, next the moving magnet phono inputs THD and SNR was measured with a 5 millivolt input and the volume control adjusted for 750 millivolts RMS output and the THD was measured. Note the moving coil input was not measured. Once again it would be nice if the SNR was a bit better but the THD is okay. Here is a plot of the frequency response of the moving magnet phono stage with the RIAA weighting applied. The channel balance is excellent as is the flatness plus or minus half a dB across the band. Next it was time to hook up the pre-out main in jumpers back together and look at the power amps performance. I used the CD input and measured the THD at 5 watts into 8 ohms at 1 kilohertz with the volume adjusted for a gain of 29 dB. The plot also shows the same higher right channel noise level. The THD and SNR numbers look pretty decent though the right channel's THD plus noise is not clearly as good as the left channels. The frequency response was measured under the same conditions and was almost the same as just the preamps with a maximum of 1.45 dB flatness across the band. I then switched in the low filter and measured the frequency response which showed a 7 dB roll off from 20 Hz to about 420 Hz. I did not measure the high filter response. Lastly the max power is measured or at least the maximum amount that I wanted to measure without knowing what it was rated at. The volume control was adjusted to give 29 dB of gain and the level of the CD input adjusted to give the maximum power with a distortion of less than half a percent. This shows 139 watts into 8 ohms at 1 kilohertz. While the SNRs of both channels are close, the THD plus noise is not with the right channel 30 dB worse as was the case with just the preamp if the low filter is switched in the right channels THD plus noise improve. I listened to various music tracks from my normal test CD on my KEF 107s. I thought the Marantz sounded fine and did not notice any of the noise that was predominant in the right channel. I played it loud enough to reach over 90 dB SPL. I did prefer to have the loudness and the equalizer switched on. I also did not notice any thumps when the unit was powered on or off. I listened to the FM tuner briefly and it sounded okay. Some other comments I have. There are three bias output adjustments per channel, but without the service manual they could not be set. While testing the power amp at a level of about 28 watts into 8 ohms for 30 minutes, the heat sink did get hot, about 160 F. However, the receiver seemed to run cool during an hour of my listening test. The first five segments of the left channel's peak power meter do not light up. The LED power meter is not very accurate, only to about 100 milliwatts. Beyond that, it is way off. Right now, I've got the volume set so that the peak power LED meters are showing about 80 milliwatts. So, using um, the QA402, at uh, 1 kilohertz I'm putting out right around 80 to 90 milliwatts we'll call it 90 milliwatts so that's fairly accurate note that the left channel lower LEDs are not working uh, I'm gonna go increase it to about 3 watts and it's actually reading about 800 and 50 milliwatts so it's kind of off by quite a bit there and we'll go on up to 50 watts and we're almost there this is just so exciting there we go and right now it's reading uh, about 7.6 watts so there's quite a discrepancy between what's really um, what that those peak LEDs are really measuring and what is the uh, actual power and right here at 130 watts and 8 ohms uh, we're putting out 20 21 watts um, I'm not going to try to fix the LEDs on the left side 
that um, could be a bad segment driver or something and it's probably not worth um, trying to figure that one out and very difficult without a schematic I would think. Once again, thank you for watching this episode of Vintage Audio Review, and if you have not yet subscribed, please do so, and I would welcome any comments that you would like to make.